Recording in progress. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to today's school committee meeting. It is Thursday, March 14th, and we will be jumping right in to presentations and discussions of current issues. The FY 2025 budget update and discussion and staff presentation of possible FY 2025 programmatic adjustments. Dr. Hillary. Thank you, Chair Perlman. Good evening, everyone. So great to be here with you all tonight. When I presented the FY 25 budget to the school committee in January, I shared that this was going to be a tough budget season and the committee would be faced with complex and difficult decisions. These challenges have necess necessitated a thorough reassessment of our programs and services while also providing the opportunity to realign resources to student needs. To that end, our adopted budget guidelines, strategic plan, as well as our commitment to the core priorities of high quality teaching and learning, the foundation of equity, improving our time on learning, and a commitment to enhance literacy for all serve as the beacons for this budget cycle. During the, but during the development of our educational plan, which drives our budget development, we had many more requests than we had financial resources to cover. For FY25, we submitted an operating budget of approximately $138.6 million. When assessing our budget operating costs, the major driver, drivers are contractual obligations, increased cost assessments, utilities, tuition, and special education transportation. Thanks to an operating override last year, our district allocation increased to $137.1 million. We are not immune to the economic difficulties faced by many municipalities and school districts across the state. Shortly after our budget presentation in January, we were informed of an additional financial obligation of a million dollars for other operating costs. This increased our total initial deficit to around $2.5 million. The, challenges, the challenging realities regarding our school district's operating budget are pressing. Over the past several months, our administrative team worked diligently to build a budget that aligns with our mission, vision, core values, and we thank them for their hard work. We realize that our year-over-year -year operating costs are outpacing our projected budget allotments. Furthermore, we continue to shift our operating budget away from one-time resources to cover recurring costs. After careful consideration, evaluation of our available options, i.e. reducing non-personnel costs, attrition, retirements, we cannot address our financial challenges without impacting staff. These recommendations will unfortunately involve difficult decisions and choices, including programmatic adjustments, shifts in services, and staff layoffs. I understand that this news is distressing and unsettling, the budget currently stands at a $2 million deficit, and Dr. Givens will walk us through that a little bit more this afternoon. The school committee asked the administration to bring forth $3 million in options to consider. At tonight's school committee meeting, we will walk through the committee through the various options that total $3 million and may discuss others beyond that. The school committee anticipates voting the final budget either March 28th or April 11th. The suggested reductions focus in the following areas, additional reductions in supplies, materials, and services, special education transportation, K-5 world language, literacy coaches, educational technology specialists, visa secretaries, DHS staffing, administrative position, and the Pierce uh, campus staffing. We are recommending funding through project costs, if at all possible. As we move forward, we. I understand that you may have questions or concerns, and I encourage you to reach out to me directly or to uh, your uh, staff supervisors. Additionally, I want to assure you that we will do everything possible to support those affected by these changes and minimize any disruptions to our educational programs and services. Thank you for your understanding, your resilience, and your ongoing support as we work through these difficult budgetary decisions. And with that, I am going to share our screen and invite Dr. Givens and Dr. Fortuna up. I think Dr. Givens is up first to walk us through where we currently stand.
So our agenda, where we'll walk through again the directive that was shared, our budget journey, directions, our reductions to date, budget re reductions, uh, data regarding the various buckets. Um, again, the committee asked the administration to bring forth three million dollars in options, and that's what we'll walk you through tonight. Dr. Gibbons. Sir, I can't hear and we can't hear on Zoom. Can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Okay, sorry, the mic was off. Uh, I'll start over now. Um, so as we uh, contemplated this uh, big challenge that uh, you know we face, and how do we close this gap between what we have available for revenues and what our uh, budget proposal is. Uh, you know, we grounded ourselves in the strategic plan and, and what matters, right? What are we trying to accomplish? Mm -hmm. um, and what has really driven uh, uh, the development of this particular educational plan, which is, of course, funded by this budget? And so we looked. Uh, at our strategic plan um, and some of the ways in which we wanted to be able to move the school district forward um, with um, an eye to providing high quality teaching and learning experiences for kids, um, creating a foundation of equity, uh, improving time on learning, and of course, enhancing literacy for all. And it's just really important to start off this conversation with these priorities um, because it, it this is not a math equation <laughs> it's not simply a matter of oh we can cut this and then this over here and no we're an interconnected system that when one change is made it has a ripple effect on others and so um, we strove as a team to try to um, keep our focus on the instructional minute, um, our, our core focus on you know, uh, quality teaching and learning, and how do we preserve as much of that as we can and where we can uh, look at it through the lens of equity. So with that in mind, I'm gonna walk us through some numbers, even though in my humble opinion, this is not about numbers, um, to just ground us in where we, um, where we are here for the broader viewing audience. I know the committee is well aware of, 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 the, of the challenge we are facing right now. So I wanted to start off with reminding everybody that the budget development process begins in October. And, um, and it's a grounds up approach where um, administrators and coordinators and, and folks look you know, uh, at their programs and they look at their school improvement plans and we look at the strategic plan and based on the goals we're trying to achieve, put together a, a list of requests. And uh, the initial request is about $5 million higher than the proposal that was brought before the board. And as part of um, our process of winnowing down to the $138 million, there was a lot that did not get moved forward and budget adjustments that were made, including a reduction of an FTE at the central office level. And I wanted to point that out because as we look at this next layer of reductions, it's on the back of a bunch of other reductions. And, um, and if you only look at the current reductions that we're about to discuss, you don't have the broader context that other things have already been let go of. 
And, um, and so if you look and you say, uh, why aren't we trimming in this particular area or why aren't we trimming in that way? It's because there's been an awful lot of trimming and we want to make sure that our core and essential programs continue in the upcoming year. So um, the proposal that was brought forward uh, by the superintendent, the initial budget proposal was $138,642,989. The town budget allocation, which is essentially the revenue to support uh, the school side of the town budget, is $136,413,413. Okay, thousand uh, four hundred twenty-one dollars, uh, creating an initial gap of two point two nine million. Okay, and again, I just I know the school board is well aware of that. I just feel like if there's other people that are just joining the conversation, that having some of this context would be important. Better? Yes. Okay. I know I'm a little soft-spoken, so. So that's, that's where we began our journey a couple of weeks ago. And uh, we reduced from $5 million another another round. So if you can go to the next slide, uh, here are some of the reductions that we had uh, noted at the last meeting, that uh, we reduced the cleaning contract by 134000 And we shifted some of these expenses uh, from the teaching and learning um, area of the operating budget in the Office of educational equity over to grants. So what that means is that the money that is in the budget proposal for the equity leads is no longer in the budget proposal. It means that um, the ideas membership that was in the original budget proposal that you looked at is no longer in the proposal. It's funded out of a grant. Um, and then the conference, the standards conference, uh, which was originally in the operating budget is now being funded out of a grant. So that uh, created a reduction of about $205,000. Uh, and so um, the gap now is uh, about $2 million, as the superintendent mentioned. So we begin there with um, uh, honoring the request to bring forward $3 million worth of cuts. Um, this has taken an awful lot of uh, um, effort um, to really thoughtfully think through the impact and the ripple effect of different um, options and choices. And what we have before you um, is the recommendation um, from the administrative team. Um, and it's in order of priority. So the first item listed would be our first, uh, the first thing that we would reduce. And the item that's last is the last item we would recommend reducing. So um, as you know from the last meeting, uh, we were waiting for the budget or, or for the bids to come in for transportation. And the bids uh, came in. And um, uh, thankfully, uh, they were favorable for us. So we're able to reduce the uh, line item for special education transportation, which is still going up a significant amount of money. So I don't want to minimize that but it's going up uh, $100,000 less. So we can reduce uh, the number by 100,000 just because uh, we got some good news on the bids when they came in. Also, um, I learned and uh, am thankful for this learning, thank you Andy, uh, that uh, the BEU president's salary uh, in the collective bargaining agreement, uh, and I, I didn't catch this, um, but I'm glad Andy did, um, we receive reimbursement for that. So, um, so what you see here is the offset. Um, and when I uh, adjust the budget in its final um, iteration, once it's approved, um, then this line uh, will be reduced significantly from, from what it is now. And that's in the Office of the Superintendent and School Committee area. Next, uh, we looked at, again, trying to stay away from um, our staff at general supplies and online subscriptions. Here, uh, we also took into consideration the, uh, the, the missing piece of the ELA program. So we were $20,000 short. And so when we looked at this line, uh, we would reduce it by 220, but adding back in of the 20,000 we need for the ELA curriculum. So this would be um, the, net, the, the net effect of that. 
So, um, and, and also just um, as we look at this, general supplies categorically went up $140,000 from the current year. And so uh, a, a significant amount of money there is, is going to level fund our general supply accounts. And then also during the budget process, uh, as a group, um, we, we were looking at um, online subscriptions and we noticed that there was an awful lot of investment made during COVID for obvious reasons on, on subscriptions. And uh, we've been having a dialogue around what of those uh, tools are ones that, um, that we're currently using and to what degree and how effective are they. And we feel that uh, there's some redundancy in some of the uh, tools that we're using. And we felt pretty strongly that as a group, uh, this leadership team could review that and make some um, good choices uh, uh, without compromising um, the education of kids. So that's the 220. And next, there were two items that were um, noted that were part of that reduction of $5 million that we wanted to call out and at least bring to the attention of the, the committee. And one was um, the Winthrop House. Now there was planning that the Winthrop House at the middle school level would be introduced when uh, the Pierce School came online. That's my understanding. Um, but the thought was, you know, perhaps if we could introduce it a little earlier, if we have space at the Driscoll School, since, you know, there's, there's uh, a need that maybe we'd be able to introduce the Winthrop House earlier. And there was conversation about that at the last meeting. Um, but as uh, was before, that would not be prioritized over other things that we move forward in the base of the budget at this time. But we all do support that. And if we can get funding from other grant sources um, or any other source, that you know, certainly we would all support that. Yeah. Can I ask a follow-up on that? Sure. Um, when we met last time, um, we talked about for Winthrop House, Looking at the net of the transportation costs is the two. Th I can't remember how much was presented to us last time for the cost. Is the two thirty five, like was that calculation taken, or it wasn't able to be in investigated no. yet? No, when we were looking at it holistically, yes. we didn't go down that because okay. this was so high. In it was so much of a difference; it wouldn't have actually sorted it out. Um, okay. Well, no, it's it's the order in which these were prioritized uh -huh. and the time we spent um, evaluating that. So Lisa did not. Um, ha have the opportunity to provide us with any adjusted information. So okay. the 235,000 was in fact the number that was presented to you at your last meeting. Thank you. Yep. I don't, I don't think it, I don't believe that number included transportation. I think it was just for the, this, this part is just for the staffing aspect of it, if I understood it. Right, but the idea was that um, if students were coming from out of right. district in, right, but that there would be a net. The offset. Right, the offset, exactly. Okay. Can I ask, ask a follow-up as well? So I just want to be clear, Susan, this item and the, the next item, so about 275K, no, sorry, 375, that's not currently in the budget, right? These were just things we discussed as potential ads. These are not true. I, I just want to understand what we're, we're talking about. These are things that were never officially added. Is that right? That's right. Okay. Thank you. Well, it was unclear. It was awful late the other night, um, as you know. And uh, there wasn't really any, I didn't walk away and see any true consensus around what would be added or not. Rather, it was, you know, let's go up to $3 million, and then we can have the discussion tonight. That was my recollection. But my recollection is that we added Winthrop, but not Pierce. So I guess I'm just wondering how these are reductions if, I mean, did other people remember that? Yes. I thought we, okay, that's yes. what we I, did, right? I thought we went up to 2.5, and that Winthrop was part of that, and now we're taking that out okay. on this chart. So but we're is, adding Pierce, but we didn't. Right, but, but that this represents a true savings from where we were at the last meeting. Winthrop House does, but Pierce doesn't. Right, that's my recollection yes. as well. Okay. Well, in, in, in both cases. Yeah. In both cases, as we put together as we thought about $3 million and tried to take into consideration all of those factors, um, this is the order that, that we felt uh, we would reduce um, 
and prioritize the uh, the dollar values. I, I think what, what Val is saying is, if I can, Val, when she's looking at the subtotal, she's wondering if that subtotal reduces represents true savings. Correct. Or whether, or, or, or whether that from the uh, two point five million dollars, it would. No, I'm talking about from from, from from our budget, from our from our budget document, our last budget document. Is that would this represent a true savings of nine hundred thirty five thousand, or of some other number? So and there's it, two numbers. One is the two point five million. So this would be reducing part of the reduction of that versus the two million dollars with no ads. Is that? But we never I'm added saying. Pierce. Right. We never added Pierce. So that one shouldn't be up here. We only added Winthrop House. Pierce, removing Pierce doesn't actually reduce anything because we didn't add it. OK. Yeah. Well, I apologize. Can I, just for those who are in the audience and at home, just to help explain, Winthrop House is a special ed program, special education program, a substantially separate one that we've had at the high school for 25 years or longer, and um, which we are now planning to move down to the uh, uh, K through eight uh, for sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, so that people should understand. This, uh, this is a program that I imagine we will also get reimbursed for from um, the circuit breaker because it's an expensive program to run. And if kids have an IEP and we can show the amount that we're spending on it, we can, we can get some state reimbursement for it. Yeah, I think those factors were taken into consideration because it's about 450000 to actually add the program. OK, thank you. That's helpful. OK, um, so next is a uh, you know, reduction in the in administrative, not necessarily an administrator, but between um, some secretarial and uh, a coordinator, we would be reducing 1.5 FTE there. And I just totaled the slide because I figured, you know, save you from having to do that. So this is a just a little less than a million on this slide. Next. Yes, yeah, so it's uh, one secretarial position and a half, uh, a half of a coordinator, or a reduction of a half time, from a full time to a half time coordinator in one area, which we'll get to next. Okay, um, so the next um, item is um, really uh, focusing the introduction um, of world languages at the middle school and high school level uh, and reducing that programming at the K-5 level. And that would uh, uh, be a reduction of 12.6 um, and about a little over a million dollars uh, for that. And Jody's going to talk uh, after I go through the list to, to talk to you about the data and the rationale behind some of these um, items that are up here. Of course, that gets you to about uh, $2 million there. And then the next three items um, would be um, uh, the, the items uh, we move forward from there. So four literacy coaches. So I believe there's 26 literacy coaches slash specialists. This is the coaches. The specialists are, are um, uh, located in the schools and are uh, working directly with students, the coaches, provide support to staff. Jody can talk more about that. Um, and so it would be a reduction of four. So you know we want to make sure that people understand that it's not eliminating all of our um, literacy supports. It's prioritizing um, uh, you know the, the school facing work, student work. Um, and then the next is uh, educational technology specialists. Again, for this would be at the elementary level. Um, it's not eliminating um, a full-time person from each school, rather uh, sharing one uh, specialist between two schools as opposed to having a full-time in each school. Um, and then last would be, and this is a little undefined because, of course, the schedule, we had a lot of conversation about different options um, uh, for, for how positions might be um, modified or reduced at the high school, but without having the um, course selection and scheduling 
master schedule set. Uh, it, it's a it's a nod and a recognition that at the high school, uh, some some cost reductions would be borne there, but we would feel it would be more educationally sound to do so when we had um, uh, real data um, when we're making that decision um, a little further down um, the line. So uh, together, the, these two slides total to three million, and I'll turn the mic over to Jody to. Can I ask one question on that? Just a Sorry. small, if we can have a question from Valerie and Suzanne. Sure. Yeah, thanks. Um, on the BHS positions, are those student facing or could they be student facing? I'm sorry. Are, are the BHS positions student facing positions that are contemplated? It's, I'll let Nancy. Val, it's Anthony um, from the high school. I think um, the answer is, as Susan said, to be determined. But the idea would be to not, we understand um, the need to address class size and the priority to address class size. So it would be within our sectioning process trying to find reductions um, outside of, certainly outside of core academic, um, but student facing positions in general. Thank you. And can you remind me, did we land at five or seven additions, Anthony, for staff? I believe five. Five well, was the answer? Seven. Okay. Right now, this would reduce from the five. So you uh, not necessarily if it's, if it's not if it's taken out of for example administrative positions and not educator positions, right? True. Then it's okay. True. Wait. And that's entirely possible as well. Hold on. At the last meeting, we had agreed to go up to two point five, and one of the ads was an additional two FTEs based on Hal's uh, recommendation that we go up to seven to fully staff BHS. So that it was, was my, my understanding, understanding that the two point five, uh, the the two point five included BHS at seven. So then but I just want to make sure in that case then then we'd need to add, you know, you'd have to select from the other buckets of the money here in order to wait. That so does that mean that the BHS line represents the two additional BHS? If you're again if you're going from two point five million or two million, and I think that's where my orientation is from the from the two million dollar, but but I hear you saying you're processing this from the two and a half. I see. Yeah. I see. Yeah. <clears throat> so when I'm talking, I'm I'm my orientation is just I'm trying to recalibrate. Either way, these would be the reductions. Um, so then, we, so then this doesn't for whatever trade offs. I see. Yeah. Suzanne. Well, I think those were my questions. I, I was just wondering if we are at a plus five or a plus seven for BHS. So we're at a plus. So if seven. we're trying to balance at a as at a cut of two to make the cut two and a half million, then you'd have a half a million dollars here that you'd have to allocate for that. But but in terms of the half million, we're saying half million not just from the additional two FTEs for the high school, but also some of those Pierce related increases. That's what yeah. encapsulates the five hundred thousand. Yes. Okay. Right, and so if it's just the two FTE, sorry, David, you, you were going to ask this. Go ahead. I was just going to say that then the BHS line of positions to be determined, I think the direction of the committee would be that that be on the administrative side, so it's not coming from the seven. If, if that ends up being a bucket we elect at all. So, yeah, either way, there's so there's three million if you're trying to get it down to two and a half in order to these are the right. these are the things if you're trying to get it down to the two million then you have a million dollars of 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 other options or however you want to slice it up okay. natalia uh, i know we're going to walk through in a little bit of detail the rationale of the k through five to come in but i had asked is it possible to get the numbers for what a k through three would look like like you know K through five to me seems very radical. So if it was to focus K through three, I know they have less instruction minutes and that's why it's not so simple. It's not like cut in half. Do you have those numbers? I do. So, um, and these are in slides that we were gonna, that. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, okay. 
Okay, so grades uh, three through five adds five FTE back at a half a million. Looks like five hundred and thirty-six thousand. Inclusive. Thank you. I'll wait for the rest. Three through five. Inclusive of grade three. Inclusive of grade three. Three through five. Seven FTE. Can you hear me now? Is it doing all right? Yes. Um, thank you. Uh, back in at three hundred and thirty-seven thousand dollars. And what if it's just grade five? We'd have, we'll have to, yeah. Shall we at least go through the rationale part or? Just one more. Okay. Stephen, go ahead. Uh, first of all, thank you for breaking this down for us. I, just so we have the complete picture, can we just list out also the extra, uh, the extra half million that we discussed last time? I'm can, writing it down right can, now. Can we, just, Good. can we just say it out loud I'm so we it have right it? Now. So that we have the full list. Do you want to just say it, what you've no, got, Mariah? I'm in the middle of it, so you, can you give me like five minutes and then I'll, yeah. Yes. Yeah. All right, Helen? Uh, so my back of the envelope, if I add this number with the other number and subtract the, the Pierce uh, piece and take out BHS, you've managed to reduce the budget by two, approximately 2.7 million in that? Is that correct? Sounds about right. If you add Pierce to that, that's what, two, Pierce is 138, so, so 138. And what we have to reduce is 2.2? No, I, I'm hearing 2.5. <laughs> let Mariah get, okay. get, can I? Well, either way, I think it's there. better. I think it's better than, I think it's better than 2.5 because as I'm doing this math, the gap last week, and I'm just confused, you said 2.2 on the slide tonight, but I, I have last point two nine was the original gap. Oh right, okay. So two oh two four five seven one was the two weeks. And then we gap. reduced, yeah, two oh five. Yep. yep. And then right. we were adding in the ELA curriculum at nineteen thousand one fifty seven. And then we were adding in the two FTEs at the high school at one sixty three ninety six. The other we talked about there was multiple bullets on the list and what we talked about was um, putting the first four on if we could. So that was the ELA, the high school teachers, the Pierce School Campus, and then the Winthrop House. So um, those were, I already said the high school teachers too. So so if we're, does it make sense for me to add in the total of the other, the Pierce School and the, and the um, Winthrop House because then it will be apples and apples with what's on this slide? Does that make sense? I think it does. Sure. Okay. Give me a moment. And then while Mariah is calculating that, a question I have for Helen. Some of these Pierce related items, any possibility of those being part of the uh, debt exclusion budget? So I think there's only one, uh, which is the uh, an extra administrator to help out with the two campuses. And I think there is. Um, I don't know for a fact, but we have done that in the past on other projects, so it's not unusual. Um, I'm pretty sure we did it out of the um, the Ridley School budget when when we had an extra administrator there when we moved to two sites, the same as this uh, project. So um, that's something I, we can explore uh, very quickly and get an answer back. Because in that case, that that potentially opens up up to another two hundred thousand in our operating side. Of. of for the, not for one year. It's only, I think it was how much? 138,000. Yeah. 138. But that's, so I, I, can you put a special education teacher in the building? It's not there? special education. Oh. No, the, the money there was for three items. It was for uh, 40,000 for. Can you toggle back to the other slide yeah, so we can see back, it? Because I thought it was just it's, one. It's in the, the, prior, the prior presentation. Oh. I, I, there's a whole slide on it. Uh, so it's one uh, special education teacher. No, that we couldn't. Forty, yeah, that's what I thought. Forty thousand for administrator and an intern. So we have one intern, which is really uh, a good bargain for um, the money. Which I is think, like eighteen thousand. I think we should look into it and see what is feasible. Um, yeah, I don't think back. I don't think you can bond money for a teacher. Like I, I don't think you can. I I know you can't do that. You can't use bond money for for that. All right, Mariah's ready. Yeah. So um, adding back in the ELA curriculum, the two FTE for a total of seven FTE at the high school, the 
um, hundred and thirty eight thousand for the peer split and the um, it's listed as two thirty five this week, but it was listed as two twenty five in the previous one. So I'm going to go with two thirty five since that will be again parity with these numbers. So it equals two million four hundred and thirty nine thousand. My handwriting is messy. One hundred and twenty four. The num that's the number of the, the deficit and the number that we would be looking to reduce. Okay, shall we continue now? Yes, please do. So I want to echo what Susan said, that these are very difficult discussions and were very difficult topics to discuss with each other and we realize the impact of what we're suggesting tonight. Our suggestion for world language is to offer world languages in grades 6 through 8 at our K through 8s only. So we would have a 6 through 12 program. Grade 6 would continue to meet as they are and grade 7 and 8 would continue to meet five days a week. It comes down to this recommendation is there's not enough time in the day, the week, the year um, that to do everything that the Brookline community wants to see happen in our schools. If we offer world languages in grades six through eight, we would be able to recoup 36 hours of early literacy instruction in K through two over the course of the year and 54 hours of science and social studies instruction in grades three, four, and five. Mm -hmm. I'm confused by that wording. Is it accurate to reword this that um, if we don't offer world language in grades K through five, we will be able to do yes. this? Okay, so offering world language in grades six through eight doesn't actually affect what happens in K through five. That's true. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Mariah. And as we know, being able to read, write, and speak are essential for full participation in our society. In across the state of Massachusetts and nationally, many students do not have the opportunity to develop the full range of literacy skills in pre-K through three. Next slide, please, Linus. This fact, grade one, if a child, longitudinal studies have shown that a child that does not develop grade level word reading skills by the end of first grade almost never catches up into reading in later elementary school. There's also been a new, fairly new, 2020, quasi-experimental study that was done by the Fordham Institute. And what they found was that students who receive an additional 30 minutes of social studies instruction per day in grades one through five outperformed the students who did not receive the extra instruction. Uh, even when controlling for the student's kindergarten reading ability and other demographic and school factors. So what we're learning is that social studies in particular develops foundational skills of analyzing text and context for students, which helps to make them better readers in grade five. So that was the rationale and some of the justification behind the world language um, reduction. And just a follow-up question I have on that. So based upon there being finite minutes in the day and wanting to be able to enhance our programming around literacy and social studies in particular with, this, with these findings, this would be a decision you would support irrespective of whether we had this financial crunch or not, because it's the best path forward for our students, correct? Correct. I believe it is in the best interest of our youngest learners for this course of action. Um, our 2023 re World Language Review also showed us that our students, whether they start language in sixth grade or they have the whole K to six sequence, are progressing at the same level as our students who start at kindergarten. And it's about a difference of 3% achieving the intermediate advanced level in high school, which would make them eligible for the seal of literacy. Our 
Our next recommendation were our literacy coaches. Last year, we also cut some literacy coaches. We had 3.8 FTE remaining and literacy coaches that are deployed across our eight K-8 schools. This is not a sufficient dosage to offer impactful literacy coaching for teachers. There's just simply not enough time. So along with this re reduction, we would redeploy our literacy specialists across our eight schools and a number to provide parity at a ratio of one literacy specialist to approximately every 200 students. We would be able to do that. That would mean some schools, for example, Pierce, would get a slight increase in the amount of reading support that they have from what they have currently. Educational technology specialists. This proposed cut would leave us with four educational technology specialists that we would deploy across our eight schools. We would pair a larger school with a smaller school for the purposes of doing this. And part of the reason that these were part of our discussion is that the ETS's time isn't a special for students. It's not built in to the student schedule. Therefore, the students would not um, experience the loss of a special subject. And then to help with our technological issues, we have a strong partnership with the town help desk to help assist us with those. And that's the end of our presentation because the high school positions are still TBD or the high school shaving that $134,000 um, is still TBD. So another world language related question I have. I see that the recommendation is for it to begin in grade six. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering if we could have some further explanation about as to why grade six as opposed to grade five, for example. And the reason I ask specifically about grade five is because when we think about transitions that our students go through, so in grade four, they start conservatory. Grade six, they're starting the middle school model. So grade five might seem like a place where there could be another transition. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying I'm wedded to that concept, but I just like to hear the rationale about why grade six. The rationale is because grade six is the, link, the year that we start offering language choice for our students. And the timing, it's when our students start to have world language um, more, no, actually not grade six, that's grade seven. But um, it fits more in with our middle school model than it actually does with our elementary model. And it would allow us to provide those students at grade five with that extra social studies time, which research shows is beneficial for them. Has there been any exploration of offering some kind of supplemental language program either after school or as part of a summer school offering? There has been. I haven't been able to find one as such, but that is something that we are exploring. Oh, a supplemental provider, somebody that could help in the summer um, for our younger students. Suzanne? Yeah, thank you. So just, um, Jody, if we go to one FTE literacy specialist for every 200 students, are we increasing the total number of FTEs? We are not. We're just redeploying them. Okay. They haven't been done in a manner that would provide parity uh, between schools and support. Okay. Um, so we're trying to create that. Okay, thank you. Andy? Um, yeah, so um, a topic that had come up several times um, earlier on was the idea of um, consolidating classrooms in the elementary schools. Um, and that has completely disappeared from today's proposal. So could you provide some background as to you know, the thinking there? Because that, that, that had been the other biggest item along with world language um, that had come up before. So enrollment fluctuations have actually made some of those quite impossible to do. It would push us over the class limit. And we were really considering the heterogeneous grouping of our classrooms and the variety of needs when we discussed it as an entire administrative team and the feeling that pushing our class sizes right up to the limit of 24, 25 a, wouldn't give us any flexibility in enrollment, and B, it also um, would take away from the quality of experience that students had 
um, so we felt that if we could make the cuts, that we could hit the three million in other ways, that we would present those ideas to you as well. And I believe you received some enrollment updates um, from us earlier today. Valerie? No. I think they Val, just came, ahead. I'm just answering that question. They just came in um, after the meeting started or just before the meeting started. Um, my question is about the educational technology folks. And I, you said they aren't student facing or they don't have classroom time, but I'm wondering, do they do any work on curriculum, on social media use or, or things like that? Or are they truly tech support? They, their job description says that they're truly um, tech support. However, um, over the years, the position has morphed and they do do some student um, facing work on um, technology skills with our students. Mariah? I have a couple of questions, but I'm gonna um, piggyback off of that one to start. And my question is, um, if the ed tech specialists were eliminated, can can someone speak to how this would affect the K-8 student and teacher experience? So I, what would happen is we would lose some of that support that teachers are getting in classrooms and deploying some of our um, computer technology programs. We would lose that support for students. Um, we would lose some having somebody in the building like right on hand that can help with technology issues as a teacher is doing a lesson um, we could lose some co-teaching opportunities that happen right now okay um my next question is does the world language reduction include a reduction in the reduction that would be i assume they're in non-personnel materials and supplies and, it would uh, include that it also includes the 0.5 um, administrator position we would no longer require a full-time curriculum coordinator for that position so that position would be reduced to a 0.5 position i thought that was in the otl administrative it is she comes under our budget okay so it's not in the k-5 world language it's in the otl part okay yes um, how was the $133,476 at the high school calculated if no positions have been identified? It's the what? I balanced it. Oh, okay. So it's just, okay. Um, Were the other transportation bids favorable? I thought we were bidding for not just special education transportation, but also like you still all of our contract for your regular education. So okay. Yeah. Before so it was, was only the special education. Okay. Yeah. Um, sorry, everyone. I just want to like some of my questions were asked. I just want to make sure I catch. So just so I understand, when you say they're the budget reductions are prioritized, you mean that you recommend taking them in order where the first one like the transportation bit is the one you most recommend and then the last two here the ed tech specialists and the bhs tbd are the least recommended yes okay so then i just want to make a comment that i we said that our gap was two million four hundred and thirty nine thousand one hundred and twenty four and less those last two which are the highest priority to retain it's two million four hundred and forty six thousand and some number I can't read, which is like seven, it's like a $7,000 difference. So I know we're not voting tonight. I'm just noting that alignment. Suzanne? Yeah, I think this is for Jody. I just would like a, a few thoughts about the ed tech position. So we're not eliminating all of them or we are? No. No, we're eliminating half of them. We're going from eight down to four. So every school would have some. Correct. Some tech specialists. Every two schools would have one. They would share one. And then, do I tech specialists do makerspace? Uh, one of them does, even though that's not his assigned role. OK. So the makerspace, I'm just curious how we're using it these days. It's up to the classroom teacher, I take it. Is and yeah, there's some really great projects. Yeah. Um, for example, over at Hayes, um, we saw the spotlight on excellence earlier this year of the great project that came out of their makerspace. So um, that is the ed tech specialist that is manning that particular makerspace. OK. But if we reduce the tech specialist positions, 
we won't necessarily reduce the use of the maker space. Correct. So I just, I just kind of wanted to have a feel about that. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Natalia? Is it okay to add a comment rather than a question, David? Sure, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the language, um, the, the K through five, I, I, I find it to, I, I understand what you presented, Jody, but I feel that the minutes of time doesn't make sense to me because you could cut minutes of art time, you could cut minutes of music time, like to say that we need social studies time, um, that, I don't know, we should think about how we invest our, our time overall, but for me, that doesn't seem fair um, as an argument for for cutting at least in the third to fifth grade um and so i just wanted to, to express that to the group that i feel that it's cutting the full k through five to me seems uh like a huge change and a lot of brooklyn families are multilingual a lot of families want to have so i would like to see the numbers and i know you said them to me verbally my last question but what would it look like for keeping fourth and fifth grade what would it look like for keeping third, fourth, and fifth? And you know, I understand that there will have to be some reductions. It's a huge bucket for it not to be reduced, but I just think that K through five, um, for me, it seems like it's a lot. And I and I heard you, Jody, also say that uh, the assessment showed that you know sixth graders didn't do any better. But I do think that's because of you know we don't we haven't invested enough. So I would want if we did have you know a fifth grade or a fourth grade to really think about how many minutes are needed. You know, adequately thinking about instruction. And I looked really quickly at the literature and it does, there is evidence that, you know, if you start a language before the age of 10 to 12, which, you know, borderline fourth or fifth grade, that you, you do have a likely, you know, this kind of critical age literature, but more importantly, the, the notion of uh, growth mindset in languages, like being exposed younger, you're more likely to believe that you can learn languages if that experience has been good. So I do want to make sure that, you know, the, I don't know. I, I, I want to make sure that just because our students were not performing well, that we don't blame that entirely on a system that clearly was not set up necessarily to work if they're only getting 40 minutes or 30 minutes or a lot of substitute teachers, you know. So I'm just voicing my concern with a full K through five. I would feel quite uncomfortable with that. David, may I respond to sure. a couple of things? Unfortunately, um, contractually, we can't reduce the amount of, well, not unfortunately, contractually, we can't reduce the amount of time for art, music, um, physical education, because it's required teacher contractual preparation time. And um, the other, um, the other pieces, Natalia, that you were bringing up is, um, without adding more time or more money, and we've been funding world language through overrides, which is automatically producing a structural deficit in our budget. So while I understand that we value it, I value it. It's something that we really need to consider as a community. Right, I, I agree with what you just said. My, my concern is, of course, we value world language. Of course, it's important to develop those uh, linguistic skills in a second, even third language if you can. But to me, it's not worth having a program in the lower grades if we can't do it well. And the reason we can't do it well is because there are not enough minutes in the day and we can't balance uh, that with other priorities around literacy and social studies instruction. So it's a difficult decision, but I don't see this necessarily as I know we're having it as a discussion in the context of our budgetary gap, but I think this is something we were going to likely move toward anyway, because it makes the most sense for what's in the best interest of our students. I would rather have fewer programs, but do them really well, than try to do everything mediocre. Mm -hmm. And that's why I was also asking earlier about the potential for some kind of supplementary program that could be after school or during the summer so that we can quickly try to explore creative ways to fill that gap, but not during the school day, which is already so limited. Stephen and Suzanne. Thanks. Um, I, I want to push back against the argument that it's minutes in the day that's keeping us from implementing a successful world language program. I I think um, when we when we explored before you got here, Jody, when we explored the decline in science and social studies minutes, we saw that they were reduced over a decade by fifty percent, and we saw that that 
followed the adoption of the world language program and it happened largely as the, as a result of the expansion of uh, literacy and math minutes and um, that I think spurred in large part a consideration of how exactly it is that we teach math and literacy and whether literacy could be integrated into uh, into other subject learning so I think if we need to make cuts for budgetary reasons that's one thing but I think we can make different choices um, that's part one of what I want to say about world languages the other thing is the the world language review made specific recommendations about how we could strengthen the world language program um, and to my knowledge we, we haven't really adopted those those recommendations. So I think we could be strengthening it and it could be a more impactful program. So I, I, I recognize that cuts need to be made. I accept that cuts to the world language program likely are going to be among the cuts. I, I would like to see though, as has been requested, um, the price tag for cuts at different levels if it starts at grade three, four, five, and six because I could see different permutations of these cuts being um, being different packages that the school committee might consider. So I can give you those numbers if you want to write that them down. That would be down. great. So if we start in grades three, we'd have to add five FTE back into the budget for a total of $536,000 added back into the budget. If we started at grade four, we'd be adding 2.7 FTE back into the budget for a total of $337,000. And I don't have the dollar amount, but if we started just at grade five, we'd have to add 1.4 positions back into the budget. So that would probably be at 100, 110, 120. Yeah, but you think master's five. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay, and I just want to, uh, ask a different question uh, dr gillery if would you mind giving us your read on all this what does does the level do these priorities reflect your priorities as well do you have any any recommendations on how the school committee should proceed in evaluating the options on the table so again i want to thank the team and thank the um, the building administrators for their uh partnership in looking through this i think our our building leaders and they are here um, tonight um, and I think a show of solidarity around the work that's been happening here and uh, I think for a number of years I think sort of I think what David was alluding to this notion of and I think Jody said it very succinctly this notion of we're attempting to do a lot of things but we're not necessarily doing them extremely well and I like the idea of giving kids exposure um, to various um, subjects and those types of things as well. But then we get to the point of at what point do we, um, either we get enough money to do everything and enough time to do everything, or we say given the limitations that we have, what can we do extremely well? Um, at, or, and how then do we evaluate this to say that it's actually giving us what we intended to do. And I think in each of those cases, um, we come back to this spot. This is now my um, ending the third year in the district, and I get frustrated that every time we go through the budgeting process, it's here. Betsy and I were having a conversation a little bit earlier, and she brought back some historical documents, but it seems to be that this is our yearly occurrence that every year we're in a budget deficit and in an organization a high class high performing organization I don't believe it's not my belief that we should be operating this way so how then do we get ourselves to a point where we can clear the slate and then be very deliberate and proactive about what we're doing and not just adding for the sake of adding and it's not to say that um, our, our staff don't work hard, our educators don't work hard. It's not, it's not a, a judgment against them or an indictment against them, but it's saying the reality of it is with a six and a half hour day, we have programming for at least seven, seven and a half hours, and we're trying to shoehorn that in. So with those considerations, I'm, I'm in support of what our leadership team has put together um, for this reason, this again, it's not to say that we are against any of these types of things, but it's this notion that we find ourselves in every year 
of being in a structural deficit. The principals will tell you they made some requests. And I said, no, you're adding back staff to a budget that's already hard. And so I got the evil staff from them uh, in that regard. But again, it's, it's having to say no to some of these things because then it just pushes again against the limits here. And so how then do we get ourselves uh, out of this and then in a methodical way start saying, well, if we want to add this, what are all the components that go along with it? It's sort of this notion of unfunded mandates. Uh, oftentimes, you know, Desi does this to us, and we see this notion of, well, we're going to put this constraint on you, but we're not going to give you the support of the resources to make it happen uh, with fidelity. So I hope that answers uh, your question there. Something else I would just add to that. We often talk about in other meetings how we would like to see more in the way of wellness education and health and civics and we haven't added much of that yet, but we talk about wanting to do so. We can't always add and not take away. And it's, it's painful to do that sometimes, but I go back to that mindset of if we're going to do something, let's do it well. And if we can't do it well, then it's probably not uh, the best idea to keep something just for the sake of having it, which again, isn't to say we can't explore ways to supplement the, that vacuum that gets created either after school or during the summer, and that's something that I'm very much interested in. If we could develop some kind of uh, immersion program that would benefit uh, students so that they're really in a position to truly learn the language rather than just having very brief exposures that are of questionable uh, value from a, a learning perspective in terms of actually being able to speak the language. Suzanne? Yeah, I was going to speak a little while ago, but I'll bring it back up. And Stephen, I think minutes do count in our day. Um, I'm, I'm confused when you said that. Um, and the, the truth is, is that uh, we have guidelines, maybe mandates from the state for a particular number of minutes in a year on the, core, the four core subjects. And we aren't meeting all of those minutes. And unfortunately or fortunately, but world language is now a mandated core subject. And so um, we would have difficulty fitting all of that in. There's too much in the day, as Dr. Guillory said. We have about seven and a half hours, seven hours of content, and we only have six, six and a half hours to teach. And so uh, I do think uh, it, it does come down a little bit, not just to budget, but also to, you know, again, how well we're doing the programs and are we meeting our uh, obligations in terms of minutes. Uh, for those core subjects. Okay, so just to clarify, yeah. I, I'm not sure what's controversial about what I'm saying. The minutes that we lost to social studies and science did not come at the expense of the world language program. It came at the expense of the expansion of literacy and math. Well, some did because no. It all did, and this was documented at length, and, I'm, and I've shared this materials with the school committee and with Dr. Guillory, and, I, and we, we've all seen this stuff. So I'm not disagreeing with the decision. I, I recognize the fiscal reality, and I'm not, I'm not opposing it. Mm -hmm. I, I just am pushing back against the argument that it's minutes that's forcing us to make those decisions. If we're not able to implement a high quality world language program, then we should cut it. But we shouldn't make this decision based on the argument that we don't have enough minutes in the day when, when the, the, what, what, started, what started freezing out our social studies and science minutes was not world language in the first place. I just I reject that argument because it's factually false. Right. With apologies to the presentation, in my opinion, it's factually false. Stephen, but I, I think where the minutes still matter is you're, you're saying that the uh, history indicates that the minutes came from math and literacy, but we are hearing, and I believe you share, literacy is a priority. And so unless we would be taking back away from math and literacy, it, where are we going to find these minutes to have a robust enough world language sure. program? I'm just saying that these are, these are choices that we're making. Absolutely, I agree. These are choices, but I think that the most prudent choice is because to have a strong world language program, we would need to be adding minute, even more minutes than what we already have now. That would have to come from core content areas. And we're hearing loud and clear from the community and from 
this committee that we strongly value literacy. I believe we strongly value math as well. So I'm not sure where it would come from that wouldn't harm students in uh, core areas. So it, it's certainly a tough decision and it is a choice, but I think it's the most prudent choice, at least in my opinion. Oh, sorry, Mariah. And then Helen. Jody, can I ask you one more question um, <laughs> for now? Um, for the K-5 world language proposal, could you just uh, clarify or confirm that rem that removing that would not negatively impact our ability to provide preps and it would positively impact the ability to schedule in buildings? I can confirm that. World language isn't currently a prep. The classroom teacher is expected to stay in the room with the language teacher. Okay, and about the scheduling, would it, it, would it at least not negatively impact scheduling? It would positively? It would positively impact scheduling okay, and the, actually help our building leaders schedule their building more easily without the shared staff that they have now. Thank you. Helen, and then Sarah. So I, I would first like to thank our administrators, our principals, uh, for working so hard on, on getting us numbers that, that at least get us to or close, to, uh, close enough to where we need to get to. I think that's, that's, that's not easy, and I know that it, <laughs> it was probably heart-wrenching for many people uh, to do that. Um, and I, if I ruled the world, we'd have a bigger pie. And so that would solve the problem. We wouldn't have to take from one to, <laughs> to give to the other. We don't have that right now. Hopefully sometime in the future we will. I, so there's, there's one thing that I, I would like to ask and one comment. Uh, I guess um, I'll first comment on world language. For me, I think this was one of the best things we ever brought into Brookline. I think it went downhill after a while, and so it was harder and harder, whatever happened. There was enthusiasm in the beginning, and it did have an impact on the high school. What we have now from our report is that it doesn't. Um, so something happened in between. Um, I would hope that at some time in the future, we would have more time and be able to teach children early. All around the world, kids learn in the by the fourth grade, they start learning a second language, if not earlier. And if we want to be world-class citizens, as, as we, we state in our uh, values and our core mission, um, we need to know at least one more language, if not more. Um, so that's my <laughs> soliloquy about world language and how I feel about it and my lament that we, we are going to be cutting it. Uh, uh, well, anyway. Uh, but at this point, I don't see any other choice. Um, I would like to see if we could at least keep fifth grade, if that's an option, if we see that the numbers come out a little better, there are still numbers to come in from the state, et cetera. Uh, my <laughs> pie that I'm hoping <laughs> might increase a bit. Um, the other piece I would like to ask of the administrators, uh, all of you, that I would feel that any I know that we're not touching classroom teachers. However, if there are classes at 15 or under, excepting beep that has to be that small, but um, if there are classes at 15 and under, unless there's a real significant reason for not being able to, um, to consolidate, I think we need to look at that seriously too. I, I, it's hard when I looked at some points in the in last year uh, where there were some classes of 14. Now, there may be special cases and special reasons for that. That's fine, and you know we need to look at that. But at the high school or at the elementary school, I'm not just talking about the elementary school here. I think it's in both cases. We, you know, I, As much as I'd love to be able to run classes at 15 kids, I don't think we can afford it. So that would be my only request. And to that uh, latter point, do you have information in terms of what classroom consolidations would look like around those extreme levels that Helen cited? I do, I do. 
And this is based on. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, Sarah was going to go first. My apologies, Sarah. Go ahead. I'm sorry, I did raise my hand earlier too. So two times I've been overlooked. So thank you so much to allow me to speak. So um, I wanted to make sure that we um, really are still wanting to have an excellent world language program. You know, even though some of us have weighed in tonight to be a little bit critical, we do have this review where we have a lot of good suggestions. And I think that if we're going to make this decision that we're going to cut back on some of the years, hopefully still considering fourth and fifth, which I think is important, I think that we also want to be committed to excellence in this department, right? So if we, ha we have a world language review that's already paid for with some really good um, suggestions, let's commit ourselves to making sure that that happens for the sixth through eighth or four, fourth and up um, program that we're keeping. And maybe also consider this a chance to get back to um, five days a week for sixth grade to make our program really count because those additional minutes would go a long way. So I really like that idea about grade six. Now my understanding is that grade six does have some open time available. If maybe there's, I don't want to put any of you on the spot, but if there's a principal who'd like to speak to that about how that time is being filled and whether there's a possibility of an expansion for sixth grade? Helen? I would suggest that's micromanaging right now too much. That let, let's, we put it out there, let's let our principals figure that out and come back to us. Okay. Uh, let's see, Mariah. Well, is this still going to be about uh, language related or are we going to go to no, questions? No, it's a different topic, yeah. All right, did you have any more, Sarah? Sorry about that, okay. All right, Susan. Dr. Guillory, if you can uh, put this data up. Thank you. So there's, um, it, this is enrollment as of uh, today. And um, we were looking at this, you know, kind of all along to see where are those class sizes now. So when we developed the budget, it was based on October 1 uh, enrollments. And then we rolled the cohorts forward. Uh, the kindergarten number uh, was estimated by our Office of Enrollment and Registration based on their best, uh, their, their historical knowledge of, uh, and current conditions on what that might be. So that's where the kindergarten came from. And it, as you can see in this chart, we're just rolling forward from uh, FY24 to FY25 when we're doing our projections. The other thing I, I just want to note before I get into the data is that as we take away some of these support services for uh, educational technology and literacy, um, it also puts additional burdens, let's say, on teachers. And not that it's a burden to provide those, but it's an adjustment that needs to be made in order for them to modify what they're doing uh, to incorporate work that was then previously done maybe as a co-teaching um, arrangement or some other um, supports that they provided to the classroom teachers. So that was also in our mind as we were thinking about these numbers. So as you know, when you had asked me um, to, uh, to share with you how many, how many sections across the elementary schools that if we were to have collapsed would result in a still meeting guideline, the answer to that question based on October 1 enrollments was 12. Um, enrollments as of today, that number is not 12. They've shifted around. And I know Dr. Guillory has shared with you that our peak with enrollment happens, you know, in the winter time. And so what we're seeing here today as we're looking at this is some of, some of the shifting or churning, as we say, of enrollments here in Brookline, which um, are actually higher than most school districts that I've been in. And I think it has to do with the population of um, uh, uh, students that are uh, engaged in, in graduate level work um, and in the, the hospitals around us. So um, just to take a look at this then. So uh, I put it in the same format you saw in the budget. So you know, hopefully that that's, uh, provides you with an orientation. The first uh, line, of course, is, is enrollments of today. The next one I've explained, FY25 projection, would then be uh, moving those cohorts up. 
the number of classes represent the number of teachers that we currently have in the budget. And I did make those corrections in the two that I had noted previously that, that were off by one. And then I, uh, beneath that, I, I provided you again with the average class size. Uh, the line below that is the guideline by grades. Um, so K through or pre-K through two is 22 is your guideline. And then 25 from grade three through eight. Um, so I, I, I just, for orientation. And then what I did is I collapsed every section by one. So you could then compare uh, what, it, what the class size would be if we collapsed each section, each, each grade level by one section. And so what you can see here, and as we go through the slides, if it's highlighted in yellow, that means that uh, if we collapse, we would be uh, below. What you're going to see, so first of all, before we go through each, I want to give you a little bit of information that I think will be helpful. Four of the sections that are over um, or could be collapsed are at the middle school level. And at the middle school level, it's much more complicated. It's not a matter of just taking one teacher out, right? It's, it's several teachers because they're teaching different subjects. So it's not a matter of you can just reduce one person. You would be, in fact, removing parts of multiples in order to get to that. So it creates a, a, a lot of uh, complication at the middle school level. Also, as we were thinking about the middle school level, you know that there's a task force that's looking at middle school right now. And so we realize that not only do we have to make these reductions, but the committees are, are also committed to another million dollars in reductions next year before we even start the budget process. So we did think about the short-term downstream impacts as well as, as the upstream impacts of making choices at this time, knowing that we're going to have to um, continue to have this dialogue moving forward. So for the sections in middle school, um, I believe it's two sections are, two or three sections are three through five and uh, the remaining uh, that are over, and it's 10 in total now, um, are at the uh, uh, lower levels, early childhood. So at the Baker School, um, the eighth grade, if you reduced it, but you can't just reduce one person, these would be parts of of, of several individuals, um, which then creates a whole host of scheduling uh, challenges. And keeping teachers um, at less than full time in multiple subject areas is, is just, uh, and sharing even is not really necessarily an option there either. So that's the Baker School. At Driscoll, um, there are no sections at this point that um, you could collapse. So if we look again at the bottom line that says if collapsed, you see that each of those um, if collapsed would be at or over the guideline. Um, so I should have yellowed the pre-K. Again, at the early uh, childhood level to have classes of 22, especially as we're introducing this new uh, literacy curriculum, it's just we don't feel it's, uh, it, you know, we're such on, on the margins um, here. We're not significantly over uh, or under um, guideline, as you'll see. So that's Driscoll at the Hayes. Again, um, similarly, there were no uh, sections that could be collapsed um, from my earlier uh, report, and it still remains the same here. There's, so the shift in total enrollment uh, is three at this point between October and uh, at this point in the year at the Hayes School. At Lawrence. There's three, but as you can see, again, they're right there on the edge. <laughs> so um, if there's any um, shifting in any way, uh, that, um, that those would put them over. And then, uh, again, we don't want to be scrambling as we get enrollments coming in or shifting around, depending on what happens with Pierce. Lawrence is one of the uh, bordering schools that could take some of those students. So again, we're trying to be mindful of, of all of the context that we're we're um, you know, faced with or that we can imagine for the upcoming year might, might present us with some, some obstacles for making reductions in sections. So there's, although there's three here, you know, um, grade one is at 22. Uh, at grade three, it's at 24. The guideline's at 25. Um, at grade seven, again, middle school, you're at 24 versus uh, 25 being the guideline. When we look to uh, Lincoln, at Lincoln, um, and again, this is another middle school. This was one of the sections that we were had an eye on um, earlier. 
And uh, again, if you collapse sections there, um, there would be one that would be at guideline and the rest would be over guideline even after collapsing. So though again, uh, this one is highlighted, um, we're right on we're right on guideline here. So there, there's not, and that was true even in the analysis uh, that I provided you earlier. There were a uh, number of them that were right there. They're on the guideline. They meet your guideline, but they're not, they're not over, but they're, they're not really under either. So there's one there. And then at Pierce, and again, you know, we have early childhood at uh, uh, an average class of 20, so that would probably be the lowest. Um, also to, to take into consideration that some of the schools have smaller actual physical space than others. Um, so we tried to think about those things as well. And Pierce is a, is a little tricky because of the uh, building project and we're not really sure. It could be in fact that we have some out migration here and in migration elsewhere and need to, to do some shifting there. So at Pierce, there's three that don't quite um, meet the guideline, but again, um, not um, classes that are that is super t super tiny. So just uh, a question I have about Pierce. Yeah. So Pierce eighth grade, uh, collapsing by a section would still be four under the guideline. So I'm just wondering what the thinking is there. Is there some particular reason why that's not a potential option to look at? Yeah, at the eighth grade. Right. Yeah. Again, it's that same challenge of it's not one person we're reducing. So it's pieces of different teachers, and so uh, the concern here is not being able to maintain the staff that we have right now because we'd have to actually be reducing multiple teachers in order to get to the guide in order to adjust for the guideline it, elementary schools it's a one-for-one -one situation so it's it's an easy math but when you uh, go to a team model at a middle school then you're actually um, uh, multiple teachers are teaching uh, the students in that co in that co in those cohorts so that's the challenge for all for, in all cases at the middle school level and again, with the middle school being reviewed, it's it, some of its timing. You know, we really want to better understand, um, you know, uh, you know, the implications of making these decisions in relation to the information we learn um, from the from the uh, study that's taking place right now. Um, so, for those reasons, we we all felt uh, that 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 would not be something that we would look at at this point in time given where we're at in, in, in looking at that particular uh, um, area of focus. Uh, next we have Ridley. And again, here you see, even if we collapse, um, we're, um, 21 uh, and 25 are not, uh, you know, we're right, we're right there. We're right on the guideline now. Um, and just one below in the first grade, um, again, with with making some of these shifts with the supports um, that we've we've put on the table, doing both um, at the same time we felt would be far more disruptive to kids um, and teachers. And so um, again, that's some of the re rationale we we used when we were thinking about um, this. If you want to go to uh, Runkel, at Runkel again here there wasn't any sections to collapse. Uh, in the initial review, and, and, and that remains even if we collapse here, um, you know, uh, we would be over guideline. So that's, that's the most current data. Happy to share that, this, this slide um, with you, or this uh, PDF with you, so you have it handy. Any questions or comments? So, uh, Sarah? Hopefully throughout the evening we've said thank you too, but thank you for that, that it was excellent and just so clear and you understand the personnel implications of it so well, so thank you. Anyone else? Okay. All right, are there any additional slides or explanations? Any other comments from school committee members about how to move forward here? Go ahead, Helen. So one piece that still is missing, I think, from our calculations is the amount of the um, health insurance. 
state health insurance. I don't, do you have that possibly? So great question. Um, Susan and I are meeting with uh, the administrator and deputy administrator on Monday. Um, the preliminary conversation that I had with him last Friday, though, was that it, the numbers weren't coming in good. They were coming in at that 10% or higher range. But he said, you know, for his side, it wasn't looking as promising. And I hope I'm not sharing his information before he shared it. Um, but our side, um, he hasn't done, uh, he and Melissa hadn't looked at that as of yet, but we'll get that information Monday, get some insight to it. The assumption in giving us our numbers was a 10% increase. Right. Okay. So, so I think his signal, signaling at least that the preliminary look at that was that it was coming in around those numbers, right. but they haven't looked at our side deeply yet. And if the state were to, because many, as many people have read, the, the Globe uh, had a huge article about every district experiencing probably worse than what we are um, in terms of cuts and, and the amounts of uh, deficits that they have. Um, I'm wondering if the legislature were to decide on more money, are we going to, I think one of the things we need to think about is where would we put back uh, monies into the budget, or would we hold those aside and wait to see where we need to if we get a sudden influx of students or something like that? I mean, those are things I think that, you know, I'm not sure when we're going to vote the budget. It's not clear to me uh, how long we wait. Do we wait till uh, the, the House budget came out or it's coming out? We're supposed to vote on March 28th. The House. No, no. We, are, uh, we will be voting on March 28th. And when likely. does the House vote? Does uh, Val, you know that? Yeah. So the House budget will come out just before school vacation, and then they'll debate it after school vacation. So they won't vote it until close to the end of April. In the end, yeah. But the, we had more sense of where it was going. It's just uh, yeah, around school know. vacation, we'll have a, a, a sense of where they're headed. Stephen? Um, two questions. One, just a uh, process question. So our task is to think about cuts totaling about 2.45 million from what's been presented to us. Correct. OK. Uh, I have a question. Jody, can, can I ask you about the literacy coaches? Um, so given that we're looking to potentially roll out new literacy curricula, can you talk a bit about the anticipated professional development around that literacy curricula? And uh, the reason I'm asking is because I'm wondering if we don't essentially have a built-in training of trainers system with the literacy coaches, and if that wouldn't offer us essentially a savings with what we have already. So the most programs, we haven't chosen a program yet. That'll be some work that we do later this spring and early this summer. Um, but most programs come in with a built-in train-the-trainer model. We would have our literacy specialists participate in that. So literacy specialists, not yeah. our literacy coaches. Correct. Literacy coaches are the teacher-facing. Correct. And then maybe we would, as we have more capacity um, and we have better literacy materials for our teachers to use, we could possibly reinstate some of the coaches from the literacy specialist pool because we would need less direct services to students. And the literacy coaches currently cover multiple schools, correct? Correct. If roughly one per two schools? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Now, a question I have for the committee and also Dr. Guillory or Jody or the or the principals, if you want to opine on this, uh, we've heard some comments from Natalia and Sarah and Helen to some extent about whether we have to eliminate the full K-5 group for world language or whether it could start at grade four or whether it could start at grade five. And so I'm just wondering if we could hear more about the rationale for why it should start in grade six. We did have that study about great students in grades one through five benefit from more social studies. Uh, but is there anything beyond that? Uh, 
again, it's um, there's some very practical operational pieces of this is that if we start at grade five, we end up with more fractional pieces of people. Um, and those positions are very hard to hire for, which is one of the things that we've noticed this year. Um, Stephen's point was well taken, um, and I think Sarah also made the point that our literacy, and not our literacy review, that's the review we're doing now, our world language review had a lot of great suggestions in it. We feel that we have the bandwidth to implement those suggestions at grade six and beyond, where if we dilute um, our area of focus, we would not be able to do that. So it's really the practical aspects of hiring fractional people, scheduling um, people to teach those pieces, which lead to the structural inequities that we've heard so much about from our um, K to five um, teaching staff in world language. And in addition, we feel that this is the place that we can really make a difference and strengthen our program so that we have the strongest six through 12 program that we can possibly have. All right, Sarah? The other answer to that, of course, is also when you're looking at where you're going to start your program is obviously how many hours of total instruction a student has in their full sequence. So anything that we can bring it down to is additive. As long as in the elementary le levels, we always have 90 minutes. And then um, in sixth grade, I think that we really do much better if we have it every single day. So if we're looking at a student who would be likely to take the same language 6 through 12 or 5 through 12, um, the benefit is, is that the student would have more hours of instruction if you bring it down lower. Then the other thing that Natalia was speaking about in terms of deciding where you start is that prior to age 12, if you start and get some real strong instruction like in, you know, not just you've started yesterday before you turn 12, but that prior to turning 12, you, you have some good instruction behind you, that is shown as being beneficial to language learning. So everybody likes to see younger um, starts for world language. So how do you, and this is a question to all of you, not just you, Sarah, but if you have an answer, that's fine. Uh, so how do we balance, in, in your opinion or the opinion of anyone else, these competing interests of the practicality of hiring fractional FTEs to have a partial grade four and or grade five program as opposed to making it a bit easier on the logistics and then having possibly a full grade six as you were talking about, which very much interests me as well. Well, I think that um, Jody was speaking a little bit in the abstract, right? So she was sort of saying, of course, that will be hard to fit in, but we could do an analysis of the actual people who we have in the buildings because our um, teachers don't work out to be perfectly one FTE um, for what we need right now, right? So we might be able to add to some people's positions and, um, and make them into a full-time person in order to accomplish this, but it would be different building by building. And theoretically, it's tough, but can it be done? It might, it might work out better than we um, expect just because of the fact that we already have part-time people. Anyone else? All right, uh, then I guess we are. I guess I would just say that sure. we, would have to, we would have to get that analysis fairly quickly, right? Right. Because um, for us to, really weigh whether an additional year. So you'd like to see what the program would look like with the specific students that we have and teachers that we have, what would the program look like and what the, would the expense be if we had an additional level I think year? we have the expense. I think the question is, is it, just, is it feasible from a human resources point of view, especially bearing in mind that we've had a lot of criticism from world language teachers that there have been untenable positions this year. So we wouldn't want to create positions that require running around like checking them out ahead. That's something that we could, right, it might keep them from running around, right. So that's something that we can, it, it's, um, it's not impossible to, it, like, to show you what that would look like with the staff that we currently have. So we could do that. Mariah? If we decide to make a request like that for that level of analysis, I would like the committee to take a vote on it because I think it's a lot of work and I want to be clear that there's a majority interested in receiving that analysis before we, as opposed to a, like a minority of members um, wanting that. All right, we could do that. So it sounds like you're moving that 
I'm not moving anything. Someone who wants it should be moving whatever it is they right. want. We're, so. we're, what we're moving is not the cuts yet. That's going to come on the 28th. What we're moving is whether we would like to have an analysis of the logistics around starting in grade four or starting in grade five. It sounded to me at least that there's unanimity on the committee about not continuing for K3. That sounds, I, I think that covers everybody, but some would like to start in grade four, some would like to start in grade five, some are probably okay with starting in grade six. So the question is, do we want to ask central office to perform that analysis about whether it would be feasible and or practical to consider expanded programming at grades four and or five, or whether that would exacerbate the current situation of where we have all these fractional people. So they, they did give us the money, right? And they did give us the FTEs. You just want to take a look at the existing? At the actual schedules for actual teachers, personnel that we already have, how difficult would it be to schedule that program? May I ask a clarifying question? Are you asking us to schedule world language for each building now in grades yeah. four through five? No, to do an analysis. And so I, I appreciate Mariah saying that that would be a lot of work. And I know that you can't schedule something that we don't know what the rest of the schedule looks like next year. I totally appreciate that. I was talking about filling out FTEs okay. with existing personnel's um, schedules. I'm not sure how to do that without each building schedule. Um, so can you give me more detail about what it is that you're looking for? So if we have a teacher that's available to us, so if once we staff sixth through eighth grade, do we have just you know two FTEs um, of teachers in that building? Or do we have like a two and a half situation? And so if we put in a couple classes of fourth and fifth grade, we would then have three FTEs in that building to offer. I'm not sure we can do that without looking at each individual school schedule, but we will certainly, if the committee votes this, do our best to try. Uh, Sorry, can, can I ask an, an additional question on that? Because this is sounding now really complicated. So if we're adding fourth and fifth grade, some schools have different languages in lower grades than they offer in middle school. So I don't know if this is for Sarah or for Jody, how would we ever sort out what fractionals of which language we were adding? If that makes any sense. So in our buildings, we tend to know that each year we have, well, through fifth grade, we only have one language, I guess. Sorry, that's the, that's the answer. No, but through fifth grade, we only have one language in each building. So um, that doesn't enter into what we're talking about. It, well, it does, Sarah, if you use Driscoll for an example, because Mandarin drops off substantially in the sixth to eighth grade calculation, but it's the only language offered in K to five, right? So it's- Right, that's the same for every building. So we don't have language choice K through five in every building. So I guess I'm not understanding how the fractional would help in that circumstance, right? So, if you have, say you have a fractional is, is in Spanish at Driscoll, how does that help if you're adding Mandarin fourth and fifth grade? Oh, right. So if, if we had it in Spanish, then that wouldn't work. That would be what we would be looking into. If we had the fractional person in Mandarin and needed to add in Mandarin sections, then that would work. OK. I'm not talking about scheduling teachers ahead of time. I'm talking about FTEs equaling one person, it, it's not actually complicated. I, I'm really sorry that I, I brought it up, but it's, it, you don't have to schedule the, the year. In our schools, like we tend to have the same number of sections every year for language. And I'm not talking about trying to figure out a teacher's schedule prior to that year. I'm talking about counting up FTEs that are needed in order to add in fourth and fifth grade. Maybe we've already got to the point that we said we're not going to explore this because it doesn't make sense to anybody else. Well, if you want to move it, 
move it. Uh, so, Sarah, how is that not already covered by what Jody told us? She said it was five FTE for grades three through five, two point seven for grades four through five, and one point four for grade five alone. So, if all you're talking about is across the number of FTE across buildings. So, yeah, we can take that as an average. You know. Okay. I think. I, I think we're not interested. I think we should move on. All right, so did someone want to move that request, or are we moving on? I, I, if I Ellen? Can, I think it seems to me I, I'm in agreement that we need to know it, but I think we could go by the amount of 1.5. It could be less if there was an ability to, to use partial FTEs, and it would be less because there'd be less health care costs, et cetera, because if you put somebody to 1.0, you're, you're still paying the same health care costs as somebody who's 0.75. Or I, guess, I guess the part that's difficult is that's over different buildings. Right. Right. The, con the concern being articulated by central office is it's much harder to hire a, a 0.3, if that's what it is, at each building as opposed to pooling it together. And so I think Sarah wants to, if we could, perform an analysis to see whether what we currently have in-house building by building works out in such a fashion that you could cover an additional grade or two with what you already have. The FTE counts. Going to full time. Right. The FTE counts that we have now are across the whole district. So that part in and of itself doesn't really answer the question about the logistical challenge. Do, do any of our principals just know the answer offhand? No. Worth a shot. Na Natalia? I mean, I'm, I'm hearing this logistical challenge, and I wonder if it would require us uh, having a single language. Like, I think it's a logistical challenge in part because if in fifth grade, like that 1.5 across five, you know, across many schools, but it, so it may require some rethinking of the whole program. And I think fundamentally, that's not up to us, but I do still, you know, like I recognize it would be more work, but I still feel strongly that we should consider on aggregate on our budget. And and unless somebody says it's just impossible, uh, like completely impossible to rethink. And, it, and I'm serious that it might mean that we have fewer, uh, right now we have three or four languages across the K through eights. But so you, you really are thinking about this the right way. But if we're looking at adding in fourth and fifth to an existing sixth through eighth model, we're only talking about one language in each building because we don't offer two languages at fourth and fifth. No, but I'm saying one, it may require that that whole school, third, fourth through eighth, would be one language so that the mixing up, so that schools have that flexibility. Because if, if Chinese is you know, offered across all schools and then the, those, FD, like the, the logistics might, I just, I, I think it may, the logistical solution may be that the entire school has that one language that you don't have a choice. But anyways, I'm, my, I'm... My, my worry there, Natalia, would be that then we are effectively taking away choices for students when they get to the high school. Because if it's only one language at the K through eight, then realistically, the student would probably continue with that language. And if not, then did it really serve them if they go in another direction in grade nine? Mariah? Um, I think we heard from Jody that K through five would allow the ability of the buildings to schedule, and and it sounds like it's sort of been considered and is the strongest approach to this. And so my feeling is just to, um, I don't, I'm not interested in having a huge logistical challenge and imagining that we're like all of a sudden blowing up a whole world lang language programs across the district. To me, that feels like it's actually more disruptive to world language and the world language program than um, what's being proposed now and the, what's being supported by the building leaders. So if that were even on the table, I would not be voting for it. Anyone else? Oh. Helen? Yeah, I'd like to request that maybe next year we look at it in curriculum and sort of examine what take that up as an issue and try and figure out, is there a way to go to fifth grade rather than trying to do it now when we know we have to cut and, you know, it just, let, let's get sixth grade settled and figure out how to move forward might be the way to go about it and do it in subcommittee. This is not the place to try and figure this out, unfortunately. Not that I, you know, don't agree with you, but I think that 
if we were to go forward with starting in grade six, would that mean that each building has at least Spanish and French? Would that also include Mandarin? What would that look like? Do we know no, yet? The, the way that our program is currently is we have um, in two of our buildings, we have Mandarin in the middle school, six through eight. In all of our buildings, we have Spanish. And then in the buildings where we don't have Mandarin as the second choice, we have French. Pierce. So if we have a six to eight program, when the student gets to fifth grade, they can choose between Spanish and French, or they can choose between Spanish and Mandarin. Okay, thank you. All right, any further discussion on world language or on any aspect of the budget? Mariah. David, will you be forecasting for the public our process from now through the 28th? Well, we will certainly be soliciting public comment and also any of you who either want to sign up verbally for public comment or send us emails with your thoughts, we will certainly review them and consider them. And then on the uh, 28th, we will likely take a vote on the budget. Thank you. Stephen? I guess I just want to say, um, first, thank you, David, for docketing this special edition of School Committee where we can just focus on the budget. And I also uh, just want to say thank you to Jody and Susan for spending so much time going through the budget. I, I just want to say it, um, it's, it's something that the size of the World Language Program, which I think um, does provide a lot of value and potential value uh, is it's hard to swallow a cut this size when when it's really only been discussed tonight but I also recognize that you didn't really have a choice because the budget season is what it is and so I certainly don't I'm not casting any blame whatsoever especially not to our presenters I just want to <laughs> want to vent my frustration at the process that I, I know you said, Helen, that next year maybe we could talk about it in subcommittee, but this I think is exactly when we have to talk about it this year because it's our only opportunity to talk about it. So I think we all have to give it, give each other a chance to air out what we can air out at this session so we can come to as, as reasonable a decision as we can since this is our only chance to, to really deliberate on a decision that has some real significance to the district. On on that point, Stephen, uh, since it sounds to me, I don't know for sure, that a majority of us would go along with uh, removing the K-5 portion of world language, that's about a million. I think that a majority or all of us were in agreement with the first slide we saw that would total 935,000. So that brings us to about 1.9 million. So what are we thinking about literacy coaches education technology specialists and the to be determined at the high school because we don't necessarily have to cut all three david two thoughts one is we just said we were going to let the community provide us feedback i don't think that we need to race ahead to the to the to this part of the conversation is my personal opinion um also i had another comment about something stephen said but i'll hold for now but i just want to say that i don't i don't want us to get too far ahead i really think we should solicit community feedback and before we make this final decisions. All right, anyone else? Yeah. Helen? I, I agree with Mariah in terms of that. I think that we really do need to hear from the public and we will hear over the weeks too because this is just coming out and there'll be a lot of people who are just tuning in. Um, the other thing I was hoping to request is can we vote on this on the 11th? Is there a reason we have to vote on the 28th? I'm just going to add my two cents, if I may. Yeah. Um, it's delaying our posting of positions because we don't know what's really open. And as we know, because there would be bumping, there is potential bumping rights and things like that. So it would delay our ability to post and hire, which is something that I know our principals are very eager to do right now so that we can still have a chance at attracting the best candidates. Yeah. OK. Thank you. All right. Um, my other comment was, I just want to correct what might be a perception from something you said, Stephen. 
which is just that we haven't been talking about the budget until tonight, whereas we've been talking, well, but, okay, but you said the budget. We haven't been talking about this until tonight. I interpret it as we haven't been talking about the budget, and I wanted to make sure everyone, okay, yeah, so that's all. If I could, just to Suzanne? And Stephen, we have been talking about world language. We have the world language review, so it may not be at this level, but we have been talking about it all through We the We fall. haven't been talking about major cuts to the world language program until today. So far as I know, did I miss something? Yeah, so I think. You're saying he's right. Yeah, so I think the opportunity to deliberate openly and transparently like this is, is appropriate to this meeting. So I'm no, I'm not saying it's not inappropriate. I'm just saying we, it has been on the table for yeah, a while. Yeah, sorry now, if, I, so. if I misspoke. I, okay. I agree with you completely, Suzanne, and I agree with you as well, Brian. We've definitely been talking about the budget <laughs> a lot. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, this is not to put anyone on the spot, but I see that we have a lot of our principals here. Did any of you want to speak? You don't have to. I just want to give you the opportunity. All right. So with that, we will move on to public comment. And thank you very much again to our central office staff and to our principals and to uh, Dr. Guillory. Uh, these were very hard recommendations to make. We understand that. And we uh, respect all the work and thought that you put into this process. Okay, so for public comment, first up, we have Mr. Ezra Kleinbaum. Hello, everybody. Nice to see you all. I'm Ezra Kleinbaum. I'm a junior at Brookline High School. Um, and there's something that I just sort of wanted to put on your radar tonight. Um, many of you may be aware that fairly recently, a student named Nex Benedict um, was assaulted and killed at uh, a student at a school in Oklahoma. Next was non-binary, transgender, um, and was assaulted and died the next day uh, in a girl's bathroom following um, a fairly recent law in Oklahoma requiring students to uh, use bathrooms associated with the sex they were assigned at birth. And last week, there was a vigil at Cypress Field organized by uh, a number of Brookline High School students. By an estimate from the Cyprus, there were at least 60 people there, the vast majority of whom were students. Um, and many students spoke, but many genderqueer students spoke, both um, who were sort of scheduled to at the beginning and at an open mic afterwards, I spoke. Um, and the one thing that was just like a really consistent theme in what all the students were saying was that we need more gender neutral bathrooms at. Brookline High School at the schools, that the gender neutral bathrooms that we have are not sufficient. They, um, for so many reasons, there are always people, well, when they're open, there's really only one per floor for the most part, and they're closed all the time um, for vandalism um, or because students vape in them. And it's not that those aren't problems with boys' and girls' bathrooms, gendered bathrooms. It's just that there are so few gender neutral bathrooms that when they're closed, um, like there's nowhere that students can go. I, I don't feel comfortable in a boy's bathroom. I don't feel comfortable in a girl's bathroom. So when I want to go to the bathroom, um, I want to go to a gender neutral bathroom. And I mean, according to surveys of Brookline High School students, 9.8% of Brookline High School students identify as transgender or non-binary. So it's not like this is a minority or not like it's just a tiny number a tiny fraction of the student body. There are a lot of students who need and want gender neutral bathrooms. Um, and the facilities that we have are too few, too often closed. They're, for the most part, on one side of the school. So if you have a class on the other side, you can't realistically walk to the gender neutral bathrooms and back in between classes. You have to go during class. You're going to have to miss like 10 minutes of class to go to the bathroom. Um, so I think it's really important that we start to look at adding more gender neutral bathrooms. And I really hope that over the next couple of weeks or months, that's something that we can start to work on. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Ms. Lisa Stahl. Hello. Hi, my name is Lisa Stahl, and I have two children at Brookline High School who went to Pierce, and I work as a social worker in the Somerville Public Schools. And I've been very involved in equity work as a parent. I'm going to read and expand on a statement that has been signed by 119 Brookline parents. 
and will be distributing, um, Colin will help me, a copy of this letter and signatures to each of you. Um, as, as parents of Brookline Public School students and members of the Brookline community, we are writing to reaffirm our values of diversity, equity, and inclusion as a priority for the 2024 and 2025 school year. We believe that equity is and should be central to all the district's strategic goals, joy in learning, excellence in teaching, culture of collaboration, celebration of difference, and ethic of wellness. We stand united, both parents of color and allies, to acknowledge many of our community who have experienced racism, cultural insensitivity, and a lack of belonging here in Pub Brookline Public Schools. This is cur currently an unfortunate reality for many children and families in our community, and it harms us all. We must do our part to change that. Equity means excellence for all students. Biased treatment of students of color, segregated classes, and curriculum that, that don't reflect all cultures and classes do not serve any students well. Recruiting and retaining faculty whose ethnicity and race mirror the diversity of our students is crucial. Their living experience is illuminating and key to a great public education. As parents, we value diversity, supporting and retaining teachers of color, and training and educating teachers on how to thoughtfully navigate complex issues of racism, bias, and cross-cultural exchanges. Too many excellent teachers and leaders of color have left after experiencing tokenization, isolation, and expectations that they alone will shoulder the impact of racism. The strategic plan does an excellent job of incorporating this reality. It rightly emphasizes issues of representation in faculty and curriculum, disparities in outcomes, and social emotional well-being. And yet we believe Brookline can do much more to build on this. We are asking the school committee and district for a more substantial commitment to supporting equity work in our schools and to expand that support in our upcoming, I guess in this budget right now, um, discussion, to place equity uh, on a faster track. As Janae Utaro, our former senior director of equity, urged in her resignation letter, equity and justice must move from the margins to the center of the daily and hourly work in the Brookline Public Schools. We urge you to allocate funding so that equity can truly lead to excellence. Fund the, please fund the equity audit so that we know where we need to focus our priorities. And we firmly back equity specialists in each school so that we have teacher leaders ready to step in as problems around racism and cultural insensitivities arise. Fund programs such as LEAP, which benefit many of our AAPI students, Equity and justice remain simply words on a strategic plan if they are not prioritized when allocating resources. We believe there's a groundswell of support for doing the deep dive towards equity that Janae urged, including an equity audit. We can and we must all do our part. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Stahl. Next, we have Mr. Colin Stokes. <clears throat> Uh, I'd like to um, cede my three minutes to uh, Ted Lewis. That's fine. And Mr. Lewis. Hi, everybody. I'm uh, Ted Lewis. Uh, I have two kids at uh, high school, um, also the husband of Lisa Stahl. Uh, the, the reason uh, Colin ceded time to me is because we're just finding out about these uh, proposed cuts. and. You know, of course, we were very alarmed to hear about them, and it was painful for you to discuss, and it's painful for us to watch your discomfort and engage in this Hunger Games kind of competition on, on what to cut. Um, and I want to present to you an alternative. Don't cut anything. Allow there to be a space for parents and the community and you to collectively stand up and properly fund education. Now, for a full disclosure, um, I work for the Massachusetts Teachers Association. I'm also a parent, and part of my job is to review municipal finances. A colleague came up to me uh, today and says, look, uh, Ted, could you help me out? I need to review Brookline's finances. They're contemplating cuts. And it came as a shock to me. So I was reviewing Brookline's finances, and it's very obvious that this financial crisis is a manufactured crisis, not manufactured by you, but Brookline is an extremely financially healthy town by any objective measure. And if you look at the 
increases to the surplus that Brookline has enjoyed on average over the past five years in the free cash, it socked away $2,600,000 on average. The stabilization fund for the prior four years that we have data, uh, $2,100,000. We add up the reserve funds on average, it's close to $5 million a year. Now, how does this happen? The town budgets very conservatively. For example, the revenue from local receipts. Last year, they underestimated those receipts by $11 million, $10 million the year before. There's an average underestimation of revenue from local receipts of about $8 million over the last five years. Why is a town like Brookline that is so financially healthy then giving you the charge of, of making cuts? Are we, are we going to cut you know, world language so we cut this? We shouldn't be cutting anything. You heard the presentation just minutes ago about the importance of equity, and I, I suspect this is a value that you share as well. Cutting world languages is going to have an inordinate impact on staff of color. We're already reeling from the debacle of the last round of unnecessary layoffs. Um, so this is my, my plea to you. Work with the community to create a space. If we have to put pressure on the town, create a space for us to do that. Go to the town and say, we don't, ex we don't accept the choices that you're giving us. Given the resources and the ability of the town of Brookline to, to fund priorities, and given that education and equity are priorities or Brook, are priorities in Brookline, let's stand behind our values and and put put our money and our resources and uh, and live the values that we espouse. So um, thank you for listening, and I I hope that you can work with us, the parents and the greater community, to protect education in Brookline rather than have to struggle with this unnecessarily uh, horrible process of figuring out what to cut. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. Next, we have Ms. Erica Anderson. <clears throat> Thank you. I have um, two children in the sixth grade at Florida Rough and Ridley School, and I have a ninth grader at the high school this year. And I just want to thank my colleagues and fellow parents for what they said and echo everything um, that they said. And if, if you do follow, I don't remember his name, but Lisa's husband, <laughs> what Lisa's husband said, in the words of my ninth grader, we got you. We are going to be there behind you as a school committee and, and lobby our town meeting members to tell them to fund our schools because we know that's what makes this town great and what, what really is, is what is the funding behind this town and what makes it what gives it that monetary base is because our schools are so excellent and we will be there as parents. What I came here to say though in addition to supporting my colleagues is in our district's new strategic plan diversity and equity are included within each of the district's goals and that's exactly right. It's not a bucket or a box that we've checked but it's threaded throughout everything within that plan because we know all of us in this room, and particularly you as a committee, know that an excellent education is a diverse education. An excellent education is an inclusive one. And an excellent education is an equitable education for all of our students. But we have to take the steps to actually make those things become real. We have to take the steps to make those strategic goals more than just nice platitudes, and to make DEI more than just a box that, that we check. And that requires systemic change. And systemic change requires knowing how the system currently functions. And an equity audit will allow us to do that. An equity audit will collect evidence to comprehensively assess student achievement from across all of our schools. And we heard that at the last meeting when you were talking about the ninth grade leveling that we didn't know, you know, how does the middle school recommend classes for these eighth graders? We didn't know those things. And whether the audit's going to get into that kind of level of detail, it might not. But those are the types of things that we just we don't have information about, about how our instructional practices are happening, quality of educators, programs at schools. And those are the types of things that, that an equity audit can give us, that type of information. And we'll also look at practices at the district level, including our budget, human resources, transportation. 
will look at all of those types of issues. One of the things I heard from you guys tonight is concern about when we have audits or reviews is why do we have those? And I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it's what I feel like I heard, is why do we have these reviews when we, don't, we aren't then able to implement what we hear from the reviews and what are the recommendations from those reviews? But if we don't even have that information to start with, we can never take the steps to make the change. Without the information from the audit, we don't even know what changes to make to start down those paths of improvement, to meet the goals that we have set in our strategic plan. That's the first thing and why we need to have that audit as the very base level. And secondly, we need to have that information so that we can fine tune our budget, so that we have the precision that we need to make our budget align with our values and with the goals that we have. And we all know in this room, in a personal level and also on a professional level, that our values are known by our actions. And we have to take actions like an equity audit to tell our community members and our students and our teachers that these are what our values are. Equity and diversity and inclusion for all of our students, that's what our values are. In the past, we have had some equity reviews, but we've never had a full audit. And this isn't the first time it's been asked for in this district. But it is the time for us to do it. It's time to conduct an equity audit and take the steps toward the systemic change that we need to achieve those goals that we've put in the strategic plan. Let's make sure that this year is the budget, that we have a budget that reflects those goals and our values to create an excellent, equitable education for each of our students. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. And next we have Ms. Abby Erdman. Um, I'm uh, reading on behalf of Abby Erdman. Uh, good evening, school committee friends, Dr. Guillory and Brookline community friends. I'm sorry not to be able to attend in person to stand with the CARE group, but imagine me there with all of you. Thank you, CARE folks, for showing up and all the hard work you have done on the petition and the letter. School committee members, I consider many of you friends and allies. I've worked on some of your campaigns, and I have respect for all of your hard work. I also see most of you as allies who want to move Brookline in the direction of justice and equity. So it is a little puzzling that I find myself thinking that some of your school committee decisions are not aligned with what you say. And I believe, and what I believe are your personal values, as I saw in the decision about deleveling ninth grade English. I want to take a moment to revisit this from, I think, a different angle. I heard from a few of you before you made that decision that letters in favor of keeping levels we're outnumbering those in favor of deleveling. And I'm compelled to ask, whose voices are you listening to? Many graduates of SWS, where classes are unleveled and include three grades, who went to elite colleges like Harvard, Yale, and Williams, wrote to say they were very well prepared by these untracked classes, classes that included their whole time at Brookline, not just ninth grade. Many wrote. Malcolm Cawthorn wrote about how his two very different daughters benefited from untracked classes. Lived experience is a term that gets tossed around a lot, but I do feel it is relevant here. These alums and this valued teacher, among many others who wrote, benefited from lived experience of no tracking. And the other most relevant group that was firmly in favor of this change was the English department. Is there a more qualified group to listen to? These are the voices of experience and lived experience. So I have to ask, whose voices are you listening to and why? And whose voices are you not hearing and heeding and why? This morning I was talking to Lloyd Jelano about the equity audit and he looked at me with surprise. The schools haven't had an equity audit, he said, a bit stunned. The town has and has benefited enormously with equity officers in many, oh, the town has and has benefited enormously with equity officers in many departments who are making change. School committee friends, you've made the decision about the ninth grade, but you can still make the right decision about the much needed equity audit. For until we do the audit, we cannot know what places and structures and habits must be challenged and changed. So Brookline can, as we all want, move in the direction of justice and equity. You can make the right decision to fund the equity collaboration team and the equity leaders in all the schools. Funding the work of equity and social justice can be the hallmark of this school committee. It can align your personal values with the values of this school committee. It is not too late. Thank you. All right, thank you, Ms. Erdman, via Mr. And uh, that concludes public comment for this evening.
Thank you, everyone who participated. <clears throat> Next up, new business. Is there any new business? Seeing none, that concludes our meeting 10 minutes early. Recording stopped.